Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Liao, and I'm a medical oncologist from the University of Chicago. Thank you all for joining us. Today, we'll be talking about the past, present, and future of somatostatin analogs. Somatostatin analogs, or SSAs, are drugs that mimic somatostatin, which is a naturally occurring hormone in our bodies. Here are some of the SSAs that we commonly use for the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. So they include long-acting versions such as octreotide LAR and lanreotide, and also short-acting versions such as octreotide. Octreotide LAR is given as an intramuscular injection, whereas lanreotide is given as a deep subcutaneous injection. And short-acting octreotide is available as both the subcutaneous but also intravenous versions. SSAs work by targeting somatostatin receptors. So these are receptors that are found in neuroendocrine tumor cells. And we can detect the presence of these receptors by doing Dota tape PET scans. More than 80% of GI neuroendocrine tumors express somatostatin receptors. And therefore, SSAs are the mainstays of systemic therapy. Here are some of the side effects of somatostatin analogs. So they include diarrhea and stomach cramps. They can include steatorrhea because what happens is these SSAs actually slow down the um, pancreas production of digested enzymes, which can lead to bloating and flatulence. Other side effects include um, injection site pain and lumps. They can include gallstones, nausea, vomiting, uh, hyperglycemia, and low heart rate. Most of these side effects are transient and also mild in severity, and therefore SSAs have a very favorable toxicity profile, and patients generally have a very favorable quality of life on treatment. So we'll talk about some of the data that establishes SSAs as anti-secretory therapy. So these are um, treatments meant to reduce the hormonal production by neuroendocrine tumor cells. So this is a clinical trial that looked at octreotide LAR for the treatment of carcinoid syndrome. This trial enrolled 93 net patients with carcinoid syndrome. The patients were first treated with short-acting octreotide for two weeks to control their carcinoid syndrome symptoms, followed by a three to five day washout without therapy. Then patients are randomized to one of these four groups. So the first group got continuation of the short-acting octreotide Second group got octreotide LAR at the 10 milligram dose level. The next group got the LAR version at the 20 milligram dose level. And then the final group got LAR at 30 milligrams. So as you can see here in the figures, octreotide LAR is beneficial both for both controlling the diarrhea and flushing associated with carcinoid syndrome. The treatment response rate was up to 71% for patients on the octreotide LAR 20 milligram dose level. So as a result of this study, the recommended starting dose of octreotide LAR was 20 milligrams for the treatment of carcinoid syndrome symptoms. Lanreotide also has benefit for treatment of carcinoid syndrome. So this is the ELECT study. So this clinical trial enrolled net patients with carcinoid syndrome. There were 115 patients randomized in a two-to-one fashion to getting lanreotide versus placebo for 16 weeks, followed by an open-label phase of treatment with lanreotide. As you can see here, treatment with lanreotide led to a 15% decrease in the percentage of days where patients needed to have short-acting octreotide for rescue therapy. And so this demonstrates that lanreotide is also effective in controlling carcinoid syndrome symptoms. Now we'll look at some of the data that establish SSAs as anti-proliferate therapies, meaning uh, looking at their role in slowing down tumor growth and stopping tumor growth. So this is a cartoon that shows how SSA work. So as I told you before, SSA bind to the somatostatin receptors present on the surface of neuroendocrine tumor cells. And upon this binding, the downstream signaling pathways within the cells get regulated, and that leads to both halting of the cell cycle 
but can also lead to something called apoptosis, which triggers tumor cell death. So this is a phase three study called the PROMID study that looked at octreotide LAR. So this trial enrolled patients with mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor with grade one tumors, randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to getting octreotide LAR at the 30 milligram dose level versus placebo. And on the bottom here shows the results of the trial. So to go over how to read this figure in the yellow curve, you have the patients treated with octreotide LAR. In the blue dash curve, you have the patients on the placebo group. On the x-axis, you have time, and on the y-axis, you have the proportion of patients. So this trial showed that octreotide LAR led to a median progression-free survival of 14.3 months versus six months in the placebo group. So progression-free survival means the time that the tumor remains stable from progressing. This trial also showed that octreotide LAR led to a response rate of 2%, meaning that two out of 100 patients had dramatic tumor shrinkage, and the, most of the patients had stable disease. This is the phase three clarinet study that looked at lenreotide. This study enrolled patients with GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but also with neuroendocrine tumors of unknown primary. They in, enrolled patients with KS67 of up to 10%, randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to getting lenreotide versus placebo. As you can see here, by the time of publication, the median progression-free survival in the lanreotide group was not reached, with more than 60% of patients still with stable disease at 27-month cutoff. And this was compared to 18 months in the placebo group. The response rate is similar to our triotide, is only 2%. So does this mean that lanreotide is better than our triotide? Well, not necessarily. So here is a table that um, highlights some of the key differences between the PROMID and the clarinet studies. So as you can see, the PROMID study only enrolled 85 patients and actually did not complete the intended accrual, whereas the clarinet study enrolled 204 patients and completed its intended accrual. The patient population is also different. So the PROMID study enrolled only mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor patients with KSC7 of up to 2%, whereas the clarinet study enrolled all GI neuroendocrine tumor patients and neuroendocrine tumors of unknown primary. And the KSC7 cutoff in the study was up to 10%. And if you look at the results, especially in the placebo group, the PROMID study placebo group time to progression was six months compared to the progression-free survival in the clarinet group placebo arm of 18 months. So this really tells you that these are very, very different patient population enrolled in these two studies. Clinically, we know that both octreotide LAR and lanreotide are very effective antiproliferative therapies. We do know that there are different drugs besides from the method of administration. They also have different pharmacokinetics, meaning how it hangs out in your body after administration. So now I'm going to go over some more recent data using high dose lanreotide for patients who progress on standard dose lanreotide. So this is the phase two clarinet forte study. This study included patients with advanced pancreatic and mid-gut nets, grade one and two with a KXC7 of up to 20%, both functional or non-functional tumors are allowed. They included patients whose tumors have somatostatin receptor expression, and patients who have progressed on standard dose than real type, so that's the 120 milligram every 28 day dose. They excluded patients with poorly differentiated or grade three neuroendocrine tumors, patients who had rapidly progressing disease within 12 weeks of starting the standard than real type regimen, and patients who had previous PRRT targeted therapy or chemotherapy. So in this study, patients were treated with than real type at 120 milligrams every 14 days. Here are the patient characteristics. So with the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor group, on average, they were on standard dose lanreotide for 16.4 months prior to starting study treatment. And for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor group, they were on 21.7 months of standard dose lanreotide prior to starting study treatment. Most of the patients, more than 90%, as you can see, have low KSC7 of less than 10%. 
And most of the patients, more than 80% of patients, in, the, in fact, have a low uh, hepatic tumor burden of less than 25%. So here are the results of the clarinet forte study. As you can see, for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor group, the median progression-free survival was 5.6 months. And for the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor group, the median PFS was 8.3 months. And if you look at the PFS by KS67, it seems like the PFS is longer for the patients with low KS67, so 8.6 months in the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor group compared to 5.5 months in the high ki 67 group. And for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, that was eight months with the low ki 67 group versus 2.8 months with the high ki 67 group. So to summarize, the Colonet Forte study showed that lanreotide at 120 milligrams every 14 days provided clinically meaningful progression-free survival in a select population with well-differentiated grade 1 and grade 2 mid-gut and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Most of the patients in this study had KS67 of less than 10% and low liver tumor burden, and also prior long-term exposure to standard dose lanreotide. Now switching gears a little bit to talking about the role of SSA in lung neuroendocrine tumors. So this is the phase three SpineNet study that enrolled patients with advanced lung neuroendocrine tumors, including both typical and atypical carcinoids, whose tumors expressed the, the somatostatin receptor. They excluded patients who previously had other SSAs and also excluded patients who had prior treatments with more than two lines of chemotherapy. In this study, patients are randomized in a two-to-one fashion to get in lanreotide versus placebo in the double-blind phase, followed by open-label treatment with lanreotide. And although the study was terminated prematurely, here are the patients that are enrolled. As you can see, this study enrolled both patients with typical and atypical carcinoids. About two-thirds of the patients have low KS67 of less than 10%, and 92% of patients had low hepatic tumor burden of less than 25%. And here are the results of the SpineNet study. So the lanreotide group had a progression-free survival of 16.6 .6 months compared to 13.6 months in the placebo group. The response rate was 14% in the lanreotide group. And although these results are not statistically significant, if, if you can look at the patients with typical carcinoid versus atypical carcinoid, for patients with typical carcinoid, the median PFS was 21.9 months. And for patients with atypical carcinoid, the median PFS was 14.1 months. So to summarize, the SpineNet study is the largest prospective study of SSAs in somatostatin receptor positive lung meds and confirms that type provides a clinically meaningful progression-free survival, especially in patients with typical carcinoids. And most of these patients in the study had a KS67 of less than 20% and low liver tumor burden. Now switching gears to talking about other SSA. So this is pasireotide. So the previous studies that I show you are with altriotide and lanreotide, which predominantly target somatostatin receptor 2. Pasireotide is an SSA that can target somatostatin receptors 1 to 3 with highest affinity for somatostatin receptor 5. So this is a phase three study that enrolled patients with advanced GI nets with inadequately controlled carcinoid syndrome symptoms, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to getting pasireotide versus altriotide LAR. Unfortunately, the study was terminated early due to futility at the interim analysis for symptom control. However, it showed that pasireotide and altriotide LAR had similar effects both on symptom control but also similar safety profiles. And here are the progression-free survival data seen in the limited number of patients that were enrolled before the study was terminated. As you can see, the median PFS was 11.8 months in the passive group compared to 6.8 months in the altriotide LAR group. What's next for SSAs? So there are many studies currently being developed to examine new formulations of SSAs, but also looking at new ways of targeting the somatostatin receptor. So this includes radio-labeled somatostatin analogs like PRRT, which is covered in other parts of today's symposium. And they include novel studies such as cell therapies that target somatostatin receptors. 
this could also include combination therapy. So we've seen data for combination of SSAs plus targeted therapies. And there are also clinical trials on the way, such as a clinical trial of SSA plus pembrolizumab immunotherapy. And finally, future studies will also be needed to look for predictive biomarkers so we can select for the patients who will benefit from treatment. Here are some of the new SSA formulations that are in development. So they include oxyotide capsules, which recently completed its phase one bioavailability study. They also include paltusotin, which is a new oral SSA formulation currently being investigated in a phase two study for patients with NETS. And this includes CAM2029, which is a subcutaneous decoction of SSA, currently being investigated in a phase three study compared against octreotide LAR and then reotide. And we hope that these new formulations will improve efficacy, treatment adherence, and also quality of life for our patients. So to conclude, SSAs are the cornerstone of neuroendocrine tumor treatment and can improve progression-free survival in our net patients. SSAs can also effectively control carcinoid syndrome symptoms and generally have a very favorable safety profile. And many studies are currently underway to develop new formulations and combinations to improve efficacy and quality of life, as well as to develop biomarkers to help guide more precise therapy. That's the end of our presentation, and thank you again for joining us today. Mm.